so we're starting and then let's see the attendees are zero and there's one there's ed one. who we're going to promote okay um promote to panelist so darcy do you, okay yes yeah, so we can start thanks okay so welcome to the board of health meeting it is 5 32 and we're starting the first thing is roll call so your name comes up first so lauren or nils are you here Lauren? Can't hear you. I can't hear you, Lauren. Okay. Here you go. Okay. Maureen? Yes, here. Tim? Here. Premila? Are you here, Premila? Uh, un unmute yourself, Premila. Uh, Premila, can you unmute yourself? She, you did. And, there you did. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Here. Okay. And Nancy, I'm here. I got everybody. Yes. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is review and receive the minutes from Jan, our January meeting. And thank you, Nancy Schroeder, once again. You do a very good job on our minutes. Um, does anybody have any comments, edits, changes? I didn't see anything to change. No, neither did I. So may I have a motion to Hello, accept please. the... Yeah. Lauren, do you have a, a change on the minutes? Yes, I, when I was looking over them, um, I keep being so negative. I can, we can't uh, hear you, Lauren. You're in an echo chamber. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes. Okay, now we can hear you. I just wanted to know. I just wanted to know if something to the notes of how uh, plays a. Uh, you know what? Is anyone? It, it's coming in broken. Are other people having that same trouble? Yeah, yeah she, she logged yeah. off. Maybe she's going to try to come back in with another connection. So she's not here. She just jumped off. Okay, so I'll wait till she comes back. But um, one thing, I, I just want to make a comment, not to change the um, minutes, but I was doing some more public health reading. And um, a, a thank you to Chief Livingstone, because when we look at what we're doing here in Amherst, um, the focus is on um, a harm reduction model and gun safety, which is, which is a good public health focus. Um, not that it's gonna change a whole lot of things. Fortunately, we're doing okay. But um, a thank you to... Um, Chief Livingstone for the harm reduction gun safety. And Lauren? Lauren? I'm going to add it in that. Yes, I'm going to add it in the chat. Is that okay? Yes. I, I think the chat's disabled. Yeah, unfortunately. It's... Okay. I'm, I'm going to try once again. I to know okay. if something could be added to the, um, the notes. It says mental health plays a part in the plan. I, I can't hear you, Lauren. It, it, it's, I hear like every other word. <laughs> It was something about the mental health section. Mental health under yeah. a place a part in gun violence. Is that what you want to talk to, Lauren? Oh, yeah, I see that one standalone sentence, something. All right, well, maybe later on we can go back. Well, should, should we just move to accept the minutes? I think we should hear what she, what Lauren has to yeah. say. 
Okay, so we'll just move that to when she can come in better. Okay, so next is public um, comment on topics of the uh, agenda today. Um, let's see, attendees, there are four attendees. Oops. So no hands are raised. No hands are up. Okay. Um, next is old business and the toxic chemical regulation. So Tim, at our last, before our last meeting, I went into the minutes of 2001 when the toxic chemical regulation came to be. And what had happened back then is a constituent went to the, um, I wanna to say town, the select board asking if there could be a bylaw about cleaning, and it was cleaning products for toxic chemical, but they bumped it to the Board of Health and the Board of Health came up with the, those regulations. No other city or town of 351 cities and town in Massachusetts has a toxic chemical regulation. Not that it's not important, but one thought I had was to contact Toxic Use Reduction Institute at UMass Lowell and ask them for advice at how we should go. I asked the um, Massachusetts Association of Health Boards and Cheryl Sabara said, nobody except Amherst has this regulation. So I, I don't know how you might wanna handle that. Any comment? Jim? So what I was planning on doing said I would do would be to um, speak to the maintenance, uh, uh, the director and uh, he's not available. Um, and I hope okay. he'll be back soon, but he's not, he's not someone I can speak to right now. And I think he would be really important as a, a guest if I could get him on to speak to what's already being done so there's no redundancy and, and maybe we're, we're, we're doing everything possible. Um, so I think I, I kind of felt like that was an important next step, but I'm not able to deliver on that right now. So board members, what would you like, what action would you like to take? I would say hold off until you get someone else. I mean, get the, certainly at least the maintenance director to weigh in. I think your concern, Nancy, was that it was unenforceable or was not being Yes, enforced. yes, and nothing's been enforced in the 21 years we've had it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, yeah, maybe, but I mean, I'm, I just feel like there's no harm in keeping it on until we clarify. Oh no, not to get rid of it. I think we should contact the Toxic Use Reduction Institute because they are the body in Massachusetts that can advise people on toxic chemicals. And we should ask them for directions. We say, well, we have this. We want to, we're reviewing and revising it. What, what can you offer us in this process? Yeah, it seems like rather than a regulation, it's being like out there as a guideline, you know. Um, so I, you know, the question is what the role is of that piece of work, which was substantial at the time and yes. um, still out there. And all the work that Tim and Lauren have kind of done trying to bring it to the new to the new era here. But um, but the bait the underground the underlying issues are still complicated about how does one regulate right. and there's legislation that has been um forwarded by the state looking at uh statewide pfas regulation so that that's in the works and i'm not saying that this is not important but i think we have to take a step back in and thank you, Tim and Lauren, for all your work. Um, and I wish we had done more of the historical thing of in 2001, why did we 
get this regulation and finding out that no one else in the state has this regulation, um, how do we proceed with this uh, review and possible revision? So um, just because there's no other Board of Health having this bylaw doesn't mean that we shouldn't, because we are <laughs> in many right. times, and I think we had been pioneers in that one, I think. Right. Um, uh, so one thing is, uh, these types of toxic chemicals, even though they are very close to the public health, <laughs> uh, we usually just um, don't take them into account. You know, it, it, you know. I mean, even though there are a lot of EPA regulations, the EPA regulations, um, um, I think en enforcement is not the primary objective because we are, you know, we we just give some guidelines. And, they, and the guidelines is primarily saying, you know, if there is an alternate approach, which is primarily can mitigate toxins, and then we should go with that alternate approach, which has less risk. And that is the guidance, I, I believe, when we wrote it, the final recommendation was to give that flexibility, not an enforcement that you cannot use it or um, use a particular toxic chemical. You know? So it's, it's primarily saying, look for alternatives which are least toxic and then try to, if you cannot you know then you you come back to the board and see if we can get a relief on that you know and that was the primary purpose of that as uh, Maureen was saying it's not a uh, enforcement mechanism it's a some sort of a guidance you know that that we have this in place and this is not didn't this didn't start two or three years ago it, I think it was an old toxic chemical document we were updating. <laughs> yeah, what I did yeah. is I went through all the oldest regulations and started a review for review and revision of our oldest regulations right. almost two years ago. And that's how it came about. And we did the uh, biological lab safety one. Um, and, um, and, and this one was from 2001. That's why I chose it. Lauren, are you trying to say something? You're muted. Oh, join again, so. Lauren, you're muted. Okay. I, I just was able to join. Well, I, I'm not sure where you guys are. I don't have anything. Sounded better there for a second. <laughs> yeah. I don't have anything to say. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, Tim, would you mind writing an email to the uh, Toxic Use Reduction Institute and ask them, send them what we've done and ask them for any possible guidance they have? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, because that's, uh, when I went back and, and went over the whole history of all this, um, that they were established after the to Toxic Reduction Act was put in in Massachusetts. And I think it was 1989, I can't, I don't have my dates here. Uh, this institute was started to help anyone in the state with toxic um, substances. Yeah, I can, I can reach, reach out to the institute. Okay. But also the, I think uh, we were talking about the procurement office here, right? Yeah. yeah most, so, Maybe that one also could go simultaneously or? That's the, the person that um, Jennifer isn't able to reach now, correct, okay. Jennifer? Right, I, I think just um, we can uh, wait a little bit, just a few beats and see if uh, the facilities director. So wait, in. why don't we wait until our April meeting? How's that? Yeah. Okay. 
great. And, and meanwhile, Thank I you could reach out to the your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, meanwhile, I could reach out to the institute, you know, have some yeah. Yeah. some input from them. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Because it, it is important, but we just have to find the correct way to address it. Okay, any other comments on toxic regulations? Um, the community health assessment update. Oh, we're rolling along. Um, Emily Connors is in her last semester of the four plus one uh, program, uh, public health program at UMass, and she's taking the lead and we're supporting her. We're finishing the key informant sla slash stakeholder interviews in the next week or two. And we're getting ready to do listening sessions. We're having a pilot listening session for the students to, to practice and we will critique them um, on February 17th, it's a Friday. One concern we have is that um, we really want to give voice to people that are difficult to reach. And I know Lauren is helping us set up um, two focus groups um, with two different groups, um, Healthy Hampshire and at Butternut Farms. And Wayling Greeny is going to help us set up a um, one or two focus groups with um, clients that she works with. And um, so we, we want to do that. So we will be doing listening sessions and the students are doing a great job. Um, and given that there's no budget for this, um, we, we don't have any incentives and we're all, I'm gonna bake and bring the refreshments to these. We're doing the best we can. Any questions on that? Are there are there other groups you're looking at? I know you're trying hard to reach people who are hard to reach. And are there more other general groups of people that you're trying to reach out to? There, we're going to try and reach elders through either um, the the neighbors group and or the senior center. Um, as we ask people. If, if you have any suggestions of groups who we should be reaching out to and know how we can reach them, please let us know. Yeah, I guess I was thinking about el elders because there are a lot of needs there. Yes. And, and I think those are the two thoughts that I had too in terms of finding some of those folks. Um, yes. And I don't, I can't think of others, right? right at the moment yes um, and also we're going to ask uh Haley at the senior center for results from the survey they did last year right right um but um so we're we're going through it um, and we'll they'll be giving us a report at our may meeting fabulous Okay, next. Lauren, are you there so we could do the minutes? All right, well, we'll move on to the ge geothermal well applications and Ed is here. And it's on Rolling Ridge and we all have the documents. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, hi. This one has gotten approval from the Conservation Commission. Um, Aaron Jack did review mm -hmm. it and state that it was, um, by all appearances, outside of their jurisdiction. Um, I visited the property, sent you uh, a letter, and this is another one from um, Dandelion. Mm -hmm. And their application is quite, um, it's quite complete. It's well illustrated. Um, they seem to be setting a, a good example as far as these applications go, as far as coming into the inspections department. And I didn't see any reason not to recommend it to the board for approval. 
So, Ed, back to running this smoothly, is there a way, if the driller is licensed, if the driller has liability insurance, if the installation diagrams are complete, and if they, we have the Conservation Commission wetlands approval, can we just go through these? Mm. Is there anything else we need to be aware of? Um. I don't know. I mean, at, at some point in the past, when Title V was new back in the mm -hmm. 90s, the, the board probably, you know, at some point said, you know, enough of this, let's delegate the responsibility to the local agent or decided not to. So, you know, that's where we are. Um, one thing that I have been working on, and I showed Jem a draft that I worked up last week, mm -hmm. I spent a, a most of a good long day just going through the different regulations that apply to wells in general and tried to make a, a checklist, um, much like MassDEP has supplied for reviewing mm -hmm. septic systems, to create a document that I could, you know, just make sure that each time I get one of these applications, I'm considering all the different possible regulations that need to be considered and then check them off. The list is much longer for drinking wells than it is for geothermal wells, but you know, there's still quite a few things besides getting Erin Jock to use her expertise to see if conservation is happy with the siting. Um, but there's, you know, the overall questions that we've talked a bit at times about, like, you know, is there a cumulative effect from many wells in a town or say on one property, like, at the proposed school site. Um, yeah. Those are the questions that, you know, are outside of that checklist. And, you know, I totally understand if you want to wait to delegate that, say, down to the inspections department for, for review. We can keep bringing them to you. This would okay. be a good example of one where I think it's a single family house that bring two boreholes application that by all appearances is easily accessible. Um, the company has a good history of compliance and control and runoff. Um, and, you know, I, I really don't hesitate to recommend it. Uh, can I just say that I noticed that the Massachusetts Well Driller Certificate is expired. Do you have an update? Oh, I can make sure that we have I didn't. Yeah, it I'm sorry. Oh. Thank you, Premal. I didn't catch that. No, obviously I didn't. But thank you. <laughs> No, the um, the representative from the company, I think this is the first time that she hasn't been listening in, in the audience, um, but I can easily email with her tomorrow and make sure that's rectified. Mm -hmm. So um, you can hold this up or you can make a decision pending receipt of the upgraded form. What would the board members like to proceed? How would they like to proceed? Like I think we could make it a, agree pending the updated uh, license. Mm -hmm. Do you want to make the motion, Maureen? Um, sure. I'll move that we approve the geothermal well on Rolling Ridge Road um, pending okay. an updated current license for the well driller. Any more discussion? Oh, no, I need a second, right? I second. I'll second it. Any more discussion? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Um, we're going to vote on the geothermal well given the updated license. Premila? Yes. Maureen? Yes. Tim? Aye. Lauren? Lauren, you have to unmute. Lauren? Can you unmute to vote? Nancy, yes. Jen, I'm gonna lean on you. What, what should we do? Asking Lauren to unmute 
seeing if she's an attendee. Check I my... have her under participant. Yeah, sometimes she comes in on another number. I don't see any email. I can text her. I don't know what to tell you. Can we do it as absent? Because her camera's off and her microphone is off. Can she call in through uh, to the meeting and just be a voice? I mean, she's done that in the past. Jennifer, I'll ask the question since I'm a newbie and I have no idea what the regulations or the politics are. Is it possible for us to assist Lauren with? or for the town to assist Lauren with um, some IT help? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we've gone through a, through a few rounds of it. So it is something we've worked with, but I, I agree it's, there's, there's not good. Yeah. chat can she vote by uh, lauren can you hear us uh. but if, if lauren can hear you know maybe she can raise the hand just to approve lauren can you raise your hand Is it an issue of reception, Jennifer, or? I'm sorry, Premla, what's that? Is, is it an issue of reception? There, you know, we've just, we've been working and we'll continue to, you know. Okay. Even if there's a possibility of a lending a hotspot for a, for a day when the meeting is happening, I think that will be a. We've tried a few avenues, but we'll continue. Okay, so we'll just have her as absent then because her microphone is off and her video is off. <clears throat> I've um, called and I've, I've texted, but we'll, we'll continue to make sure this is easier now i have nothing with her oh now lauren are you there now no okay so it's been moved and oh yeah we've all voted and nancy yes so it's been moved and seconded and we have four approvals and one absent okay temporary housing request from okay. patricia smallman on 1240 Southeast Street. So Ms. Smallman suffered a fire last in this last couple of weeks. Um, I think you may have read about it in the paper. And she is well on her way to um, having the pieces in place to restore the home. Um, uh, she's contacted us and said that um, she will be having an apartment in town that she'll be living in. Um, but she wants to establish uh, something on the property. And in this case, she's proposing a small RV to, um, to use the property, to bring her dog out, to, um, to continue to, to live there during the day. Um, and uh, this would be self-contained Parker's Portables. This is a licensed um, Santa Cam company. Um, 
nearby that services other places in town has a good record and they have agreed to service the, the RV while it was parked there. Um, they'll have access once construction is starting up to temporary power, but an RV would have its own power too. So she's bringing this to us. There's a section of the sanitary globe, uh, number 430, that says temporary housing is allowed only with board of our permission. Um, and this is talking about more than 30 days and up to a year. And if if um, it came to a year and she was not finished, then I requested that she contact us ahead of time and let us know what the best guest schedule would be. But the, the code reads, no temporary housing may be used without the written permission of the Board of Health. So we're asking the board to take a vote and um, it would be in the minutes um, whether we would give permission for this request. Comments from board members? Um, there's plenty of room on the property. I, I guess I read that they also the neighbors mm -hmm. uh, amenable to yeah. this idea, in fact, suggested it. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I think it's reasonable. I, I know the, where the property is. I've seen the results of the fire. It's going to be a while before that house is ready again. Um, I think it's a reasonable um, uh, exception to the, to the, regulation. Uh, any other comments? I, I agree, Maureen. I've driven by it um, and reading the letter that um, an the neighbors suggested it and support it. Uh, and you're a distant neighbor. <laughs> yeah, I go by there a lot. <laughs> I run by there, walk by there. Um, we saw the any smoke, other? unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, any other comments or questions? Okay, uh, Maureen. One, would... one question, if it is approved, um, what is going to be the extended time? You know, is it going to be another six months or a year or? I, the proposal is for a, a month to a year, but it's an extensive renovation. It could take most of the year. And if it gets close to the year's time and it does not look finished, and an advantage of my sitting in and, and being a building inspector as well as a health inspector is that this, I probably will be, send, be being sent out on routine inspections to the property and will be aware of the likely time frame myself. But her network of friends seems to be intent on helping her with this process. Um, and I've informed her in writing that we expect to be updated if it's getting close to a year. And the letter says she'll be living at another uh, housing unit, not there. And this is for during the day and she can be there with a dog and supervise right. the um, uh, renovations. Um, so it's not like she's going to be there 24 seven, seven right. days a week, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and is there any need to, um, um, inspect this, these units periodically, or you, you just feel like it's, you just, it's fine. And I, I, I just don't know what the standard is. Well, this, this hasn't happened that many times, um, mm -hmm. even though I've done this for a while. Um, I, I think if there was uh, from the outside, a reason to think that we needed to, that I needed to, I mean, mm -hmm. that's the bulk of my job is, either responding to housing complaints or traveling around town with my eyes open and you know using experience <laughs> to figure where I ought to get nosy um, and then request an inspection. So a part of our being on the property will be to, to keep an eye on the on this temporary housing. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? If the if there is a sanitary company which is already contracted, there, I think that's a good thing, right? But yes, yeah, they're already licensed, they're agreeable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any more discussion? Not may have a motion to accept other permission for temporary housing RV 
at 1240 Southeast Street for one month to one year. Did you just make that motion? <laughs> I guess I made it. I made the motion. Can I have it seconded? <laughs> I can I second that. Yeah. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded um, for the temporary housing mm -hmm. at 1240 Southeast Street. Um, and now to vote. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Premola? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. And uh, Lauren's completely gone, so she's just absent. We'll put her as absent. Okay. The next... Thank you for considering that on short notice. Yeah. Okay. Ed. Thanks, Ed. See you okay. next month. <laughs> Thank you. Ed. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Take care. See you soon. So next is the body arts establishment regulation. So Jennifer, do you want to just say how this came forward? And I've done some homework on it. Okay. Yep. So we had a request from our body arts establishment if they could bring in a short-term visiting or guest tattoo artists. So this is something that other um, uh, communities do, and I did a little bit of research as well. Um, so it would be short term, and could there be a short term permit to, to uh, welcome these people in for a, a shortened period of time? And what did you find out about short term permits? Well, you know, I looked around different communities. So, you know, our fee for um, a tattoo uh, technician, for example, is $250 annually. In other communities, um, the temporary or visiting body art practitioners half that fee. So that's the case in Worcester and as well as in Northampton. And the um, permit's good for 14 days in Northampton, just for an example. And they need um, uh, over just about a week to process, 10 days to process. Okay. Is that what you found? I found that and I went through and I looked at our regulations, the, uh, the state template put out by the Massachusetts government is the same one we have here. Yeah, and I looked at, you know, Western and North. then I, I didn't have access to the 2004, 2006 or 2007 minutes, but the uh, amendments for the um, 2012 were um, prohibiting body piercing under 14 and prohibiting tongue, nipples, lips for under 18 or having a properly identified parent, legal custodial parent or legal guardian. And then I went on, we only have one establishment which is Wanderlust um, on North Pleasant Street. And I, I went into their website and um, he has all this stuff covered nicely. Um, he doesn't do piercings at this time. Um, he has information about 18 years and older. He won't touch anyone um, uh, under 18 without a whole big parent thing. He has after use instructions and he does not even allow children in the tattoo parlor. So if if a it was like if a parent goes to have a tattoo and they have a child, they cannot bring that. So I, I thought that he and I was I walked in there once and it seems like a, a pretty good um, establishment. Yeah, it is. Um, so I think we just have to add a, um, a, a come up with what we want for a, um, a visiting tattoo artist or technician. Um, our um, licensing says technician. Hmm. Comments? Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, and this has nothing to do with them being granted a, a visiting technician uh, license. I just was curious about on page 11, right above the standards of practice under section Act, uh, F, it says, um, the establishment shall require that all body art practitioners have either completed or were offered and declined in writing the hepatitis, hepatitis B vaccination series. I'm surprised that they aren't required to be immunized, that that isn't a requirement um, by the state. 
good point. I mean, they're not healthcare providers, but you know, they certainly are. Well, at minimum, I I think if I were going in, I would want, or I think the public should be aware if someone isn't vaccinated against hepatitis B. That's my thought. But you know, I mean, that's if they're state regulations, they're state regulations. I was just curious about it. Mm -hmm. We could revise it. Well, uh, you know, I don't. I mean, I think that probably is a more involved discussion. <laughs> yeah, not right now, but we can. No, we no. can take on um, having that as a revision. Um, well, I noticed it was a little old, <laughs> but it doesn't. It doesn't seem. I don't know. You know, I didn't get a chance to look at it compared to anything else, but. Um, so, so that's a good, a good question. I didn't realize that part of what brought this up was the temporary uh, visit guest artists coming. Right. Um, would they have to have the same qualifications, of course, that the full time folks have? Right. The experience that mm -hmm. was a little confusing yeah. to me how that was written. Um, but if that's what it, the state is, I guess that's that's me that's confused just in terms of the years of apprenticeship and the year of um, license or whatever in another town mm -hmm. or um, state. Um, so that, I guess that's that, that they, we would need to have somebody who has the similar qualifications or the same qualifications. The same, the same, the same. We wouldn't. Yeah. Um... I wouldn't change that. No. So the only difference would be the fee and the duration of them being on the premises. Is that, am I, I understanding that, you correctly? Right. It's, I think it, it might not even, um, I think this was generated from this one um, place of business, but you know, it wouldn't be just directed at them. It would just obviously no. be for future ones coming. So we would you would decide and then we'd speak to inspections and fees and that would get changed for all mm -hmm. yes, and, uh, and i was i was wondering if if they're asking for this because if when you go on their website like you have to wait maybe a couple of months to get an appointment for your tattoo <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's what came across my mind when I went on their website like oh maybe he wants a little help here and there or maybe he wants to offer some special designer mm -hmm. tattooist tattoo artist how would you like to proceed board members I think it yeah, I was going to say, it seems too complicated to just do it right here, right now. Oh, yeah, right. No, definitely you know, it's, not it's, right It is pretty brief if it's just adding this, but I think someone or two people should take it on and try to update it to that language and then bring it back to the next meeting. And I would be willing to be a partner in that. I can work with you, Maureen, unless uh, someone else wants to. Kremlin, do you want to get your feet wet or do you want sure. to observe? <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I, I can be involved. I, I just want to know exact. So are we looking to other communities that have this uh, exception? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's really the first step is to look at what other people have and, and compare and see what we like and don't like and then and we can also both each take a look at it maybe collaborate a little bit mm -hmm. send um a draft out to other board members and then discuss it at the next meeting mm -hmm. sure i'm assuming the regulations themselves are just standard yeah yeah, and that's what I went into the state and I went into the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards and, and this is the template. And then I went into Cambridge, I went to other places and yeah. they're pretty much using, using this. I, I didn't go word for word, but I quickly looked and, and most 
um, towns or cities have used this um, template. That the state, when tattooing became legal in the state, the state put this out. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking, um, are we aiming to revise this bylaw or are we just focusing on our def definition of visiting versus permanent practitioners? You know, If we say that the, whether it's a permanent practitioner or a visiting practitioner should follow all these rules, that could be just enough. You know, so We don't need to revise it. You know? Mm -hmm. And then it will become a matter of just how much fee are we are going to charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, and the length of the, the residency or whatever of this artist. Yeah. Right. And, and in the past, you know, none of the these um, regulations haven't been signed. Uh, in 2012, the um, physician who was on the board um, did it in like two months, it came up one month and then um, it was revised and it was just about the piercings and the ages. Mm -hmm. um, so we can just put that amendment and I think it's better if we have people sign it too. Uh, there's this inconsistency with older regulations not being signed. So Maureen and Premila, do you want to do this? Do you want my input too? Well, if you have the time. Yeah, Are we, yeah, we, it doesn't seem that complex, right? No. <laughs> no. So <laughs> the, compared to some of the things like the toxic yeah. chemicals or yeah. the, the smoking, smoking materials and, those others are the things that had major structural renovations. Um, yeah. It seems like a piece of cake, but we'll see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we can consider requiring Hep B vaccine if we, because that, that is, a, a, is a very important public health piece, because it blares blood there. Well, okay. Well, yeah, yeah the question is, are, that's protecting the tattooist, really. Right. Uh, right. Um, well, that, you they're know, not, that, well, it's something to think about. I know, like, for, like, maintenance workers or it's at the colleges, they aren't required to have the HEP B, but they're offered the HEP B okay. because it would come across uh sharps or other kinds of things mm -hmm. in their in their work mm -hmm. um they do get osha training in which which the tattoo artist gets it's some mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if we can ma you know mandate it with the mandate is yes. the education and the opportunity again. yeah yeah if that's not what the state's requiring i think it would we would be hard pressed to make a case for being an exception and may, there may not be a reason i i'm just responding to yeah no it, realizing that that's the first time i've read that that you know then i have a question about hepatitis c but another time <laughs> okay so we can um, be in touch and come up with something in the next month okay director's updates Okay, so just to let you know, I got a text from Lauren, and she um, is, has a bad connection tonight, and she's going to hopefully email her comments. So I'll let you know if I get an email from her. So I let her if know. Yeah. Is, yeah. Okay. I'll let you know. So, um, so director's comments, um, update. So with COVID, um, I know I've been repeating over the past um you know, a few months that we're really not having the surveillance. Um, so I'll say it one last time. And then I think at some point, you know, the COVID, I mean, as we know, sort of the COVID emergency, the declaration is ending and um, we'll, we'll follow the lead of DPH and the CDC with reporting. So I just want to sort of say that there, um, but we're really getting about 20% um, of the tests 
the positive tests are showing. That's what the latest research is showing that 80% of testing is done at home and not reported. So um, I said the emergency status um, of the pandemics ending May 11th, um, but we're gonna continue here um, as many communities are doing to make sure that we continue what we can for, um, for um, supporting our community with everything we can do to um, with vaccination and um, testing and surveillance and especially vulnerable populations who will probably be hit the hardest by this emergency status ending. Um, so I guess we're not really in an in, in, uh, endemic state yet. Um, the CDC um, has not decided what uh, the COVID vaccine regimen is gonna be. So there's no word out um, from my knowledge what's happening, for example, this fall. A lot of people wanna know what's going on with the COVID vaccine, bivalent vaccine, if it's gonna be an annual thing, but we haven't heard yet. So I'll update people as I find out and other people may find out ahead of me. So just to let you know that the Amherst Health Department still has rapid antigen tests and is free here at the Bang Center and we continue to pass them out to our community um, partners, you know, Amherst Survival Center, Craig Stores. Um, so I really would like to see those tests, you know, as always leveraged, uh, use them before you go out, use them after, or if you're symptomatic. So we do have them here if anyone needs them and they expire in, in June. Um, the wastewater surveillance, that continues to be a program and it's been extended to the end of the calendar year. So three times a week that testing from the wastewater uh, combined flume, um, the combined flumes goes off to Jamaica Plain, gets analyzed at Biobot, and then we get the results and they can be seen on our website. And also MassDPH has a really good website looking at combined surveillance. Um, let's see, and then vaccination clinics. Um, we are transitioning like a lot of communities to uh, COVID um, bivalent vaccine clinics that are monthly now. So the first Wednesday of every month um, from 3 to 5 p.m., we have Moderna, we have Pfizer bivalent, and we have uh, bivalent for five, ages 5 to 11, Pfizer. If you, those times aren't convenient for people, um, we can call in and we can arrange another time for you to get a vaccine. We do have um, a link just as an FYI, FYI that we share with the Musanti Health Center. So if they have people that come in that need a COVID shot, they have a direct link to our, our department so they can get signed up right away. That's it for COVID update. I'm trying to make it more succinct. Any questions on that? <laughs> So just moving into a health department update, I don't do it every time, but this time I just want to give a quick sort of rundown what's going on. Um, again, a thank you to Maureen for helping us with the childhood immunization program. It started in September and we've given 53 immunizations to children. So our program is for um, students, <clears throat> uh, student age or under 18, um, that have no insurance or are underinsured and they need vaccines to get into school. So we will give them one round of vaccines, sometimes two, but I've said this a few times, it's one part vaccination and then nine parts education. So sometimes we'll vaccinate people and from my window, we can actually see people go down into the Musanti Health Center and we've made calls and they're expecting them and we try to get them with a provider. I want to say welcome to our new employee here in the health department. We have a program assistant. His name is Kyle O'Connor, and he comes highly recommended. We had him here working, uh, volunteering for COVID clinics, and now he's been hired, and he'll be helping us coordinate COVID clinics, office um, duties, and public health programming while he continues to finish up with a community health assessment. So we're so thrilled to have him. He was here Monday, he started, I gave him a, an assignment. Um, we went over it and I thought it would take him two hours. And after 15 minutes, he said he was all done. So he's very skillful. Yeah, he, he's amazing on the community assessment team. Oh, good, good, I'm so glad. The third bullet item I have is that um, I've 
we've always had good partnership with the Musanti Health Center, but there's a new employee there. Her name is Deborah DeStefano, and she is in a new position. She's the DEI coordinator, and she and I have been talking, um, and we're really um, sort of pinpointing some ways that we can do more outreach to the community um, and increase access. So she's very committed. They've always been great to work with, but I feel really um, optimistic working with Deborah about uh, thinking about improving access to the community. Um, the next item is next month at the Board of Health meeting, I'm going to um, give an, a more formal update, or maybe I'll invite Ed Smith back um, to give us um, information on the new sanitary code. So there's new housing <laughs> code. Yeah. What's that? I saw, I, I was looking today and, and the state's coming out and, and Title V mainly aimed in, in Eastern Massachusetts to decrease nitrogen, especially on the Cape. Is that what you're talking about? No, it's something different. But maybe they're combined somehow. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, so new sanitary code. So the inspectors just completed the training, I think this past week. So I'll get more information. Um, the the changes are going to go into effect April 2023. So this has been a long time coming, these um, revisions. And one thing that I think that will um, that may impact the board and us is that there's going to be a change in temperature uh, requirements. So the end of heating season is going to be moved up two weeks. And then the board has an option to move it up two weeks. So it used to be that June 15th ended heating season, but now it can end actually a month earlier, May 15th, um, because we have had complaints just ourselves, and I'm sure it's across the state, um, that some houses, housing apartment complexes, um, the heat has been kept on to June 15th. Um, because of due to regulation. So that's something that I'll get more information on, but that'll that'll impact us. I don't know, was anyone on the board when that was a- Yeah, well, well, it'll be very helpful because the Clark House and other units, they either have the heat on or the air conditioning on and you can't switch back and forth and it would be 90 degrees out and they couldn't turn the air conditioning on yeah. because of, and we would have to give them a variance for, yeah. for that. So it will make life much easier, um, unfortunately, in, uh, in our climate changing. Um, uh, yeah, because we did that multiple times for the, it was the Clark House. It's a car cast, yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like it could also flip the other way though, if you just, if you can't, do both you, you you know you have this transition period no matter when you set it where it might get down to freezing and you know sometimes there was that late frost in may or you know it's just it seems really a tricky tricky thing i think it, it does sound tricky um i do like that this sort of these two week blocks you know so maybe mm -hmm. there is some kind of you know something you can do with noah and looking at the weather but, but next month, I'll try to get Ed in and he can talk about those subtleties. Um, the next thing is that um, I'm continuing to think about what we're going to do with the information that Nancy and her group is coming up with a community health um, assessment. So what our next steps are going to be. And I know last um, month I talked about considering um, the, the CHIP, the Community Health Improvement Plan. So it'd be a format of um, community involvement, identifying what the issues are, and then looking at how we can um, best intervene and, and do programming to um, address those issues. So I say this again, that um, something that I'm working on, and one of the first steps will be, as I said, identifying what the issues are. So I think I'm going to come to the board at some point and go over um, Nancy Gilbert's, you know, what the, the community health assessment, what came up, what you came up with, and what the top um, issues are. So it's just a, going to be a community, a continuing uh, conversation about what's going on in Amherst after Nancy's done with the health assessment. Any thoughts on that? Very preliminary. Thank you. 
anybody have questions for Jen? Thank you, Jen. Um, public comment. We have four attendees. I don't see any, I don't see any hands. hands up. No hands up. Okay. Um, topics not anticipated by the chair. Um, just a reminder on the conflict of interest, you go into the state website. Uh, Jen has provided us with a link. So please do that. And then I, I did when I was looking at state things today that the state is proposing an overhaul of the septic regulation, um, in Title V, and it's aimed at like the Cape and uh, waterfront areas and the islands um, because of high levels of nitrogen. Our, our area wasn't highlighted, but that's coming out. I, I noticed that. Um, otherwise, I don't have anything. Um, anybody else have any comments or questions? You know, can I just ask, does the board want more information on COVID? Or is what I'm doing okay and you, you'll ask as we go along? I'm happy with the reports and I check CDC. I also look at Amherst Ending. Thank you, Art and Maura. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And I look at the state numbers. And the Amherst website with the school, it, you know, the school yeah. report and all their things are helpful. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think we've kind of learned where to look for this information, okay. although yes. it's, mm -hmm. I'm getting, you know, it's changing in terms of how relevant it is since the reporting is different. Um, but if you're looking at hospitalizations, deaths, whatever, that's that's still real. Mm -hmm. And wastewater. <laughs> we we yes. love the wastewater. Yeah. And thank you for sending out the the uh, water report too. With the uh, oh, with our to, with our yeah. That, I'll, that I'll continue to do that, and I'll post that in the packets. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Our next meeting is March 9th at 5.30. And may I have a motion to adjourn? Adjourn, adjourn, adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Uh, Maureen, anyone second it? I second it. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Premila? Premila? Okay, uh, for adjourning. Okay. Uh, and, and Nancy, aye. Well, thank you all for your work. And um, I'll be in touch with Premila and Maureen. And see you next week. Have a good month. Stay well. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.